lift our hands and love the Lord together again. Thank you, Jesus. 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 We simply believe in, in Bible-based praise and worship. And, and please, please don't think I am being um, maybe selfish when I say this, even just about our church, but I'm talking about the church of the book of Acts, apostolic in doctrine, Pentecostal in experience. I'm talking about the church. When you read the book of Acts, you will find how passionate their praise was, how emotional they was. All through Scripture, even Old Testament, David was one that talked so much about crying aloud unto God. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth. And the reason why our, our culture has become so religious without relationship is they won't vent their emotions in church. They won't vent their emotions to God. When it comes to that, it becomes a library or a funeral home, if you will. And, and what happens is we lose something. We lose that communion with God, that spirit of God. There's a mixture of word and spirit, bread and wine. We must have both. They both go hand in hand. And we give room for the Holy Ghost to move in our midst. That's what we're here for. Because God, God can do so much in our lives in just a few moments' time. Amen. We believe in the power of the Spirit of God to do the supernatural. That's what this is about. It's beyond us. It's beyond us. The reason why the gang violence, the reason why all the sin in the world, young people chasing everything you could imagine, all the anger, they're not venting their emotions in the right place. They need to be venting them to God. God can take care of the anger. God can take care of the addiction. God can take care of the pain. Can I get a witness? But you have to give him your heart, right? And your heart's more than a confession. It's your emotion. That is building a relationship with him. I believe it's time for the word of the Lord. And um, what great praise and, and worship that's here. And as you make your way back to your seats, we thank God for his spirit that's already helping, moving in our midst. But we want the word of God to come forth. I believe there's, I believe when the word of God is preached, supernatural things happen. When the word of God is being preached, supernatural things happen. Can I get an amen, somebody? Somebody say, I believe. And things are broken, chains are broken. The Word of God packs a punch, and it can, it, it can dig out things in our hearts that we did not even know was there. Do you love the preaching of the Word of the Lord? Amen. Lighthouse, I'm going to ask you that again. Do you really love the preaching of the Word of the Lord? I'm going to say something else right now, and I, I'm not taking up any of the preacher's time. But I appreciate our young people for their passionate worship. Not all the young people in this world are living in sin. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of young people that have a hunger for God. That's what you see going on up right here right now is father and son. Families connecting in the Holy Ghost. fighting. Hey, we're in a battle. We're not going to fight it in the flesh. We got to fight it in the spirit. Did you hear me? I said we have to fight it in the spirit. And I'm for reading and I'm for education and I'm a reader myself, but this thing is not going to be fixed by reading a book. If we're going to save our families, we must pray in the spirit. I want you to pray right now. I want you to plead the blood over your family. God, I plead the blood over my family. I plead the blood over my house. I plead the blood over my marriage. I plead the blood over my children. 
I'm praying for your mercy and your grace to be continually bestowed upon my household. Satan, you will not get my children. You cannot have them. The blood of Jesus is against you. Thanks be to God who giveth the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brother Marx preaches with apostolic authority, and um, he has evangelized a long, 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 long time. He's a seasoned minister among us. Open your heart to the Spirit and open your heart to the Word and just say, God, whatever you want from me, just speak to me. Is that all right? Amen. Brother Marks, we're glad that you're with us again today. Let's give him a lighthouse welcome as he comes to preach the Word of the Lord. special touch of the Holy Ghost here. Hallelujah. Aren't you thankful you came to church today? I'm so thankful for Praise God. Let's lift our hands one more time and entertain the presence of the Lord that's here. I do, I do feel like that, I do feel like the Lord has given me something to give to you today. Um, as anyone who is Our main goal is to have a, a move. It's very difficult in these situations because as you can feel and sense, it would be easy just to fan this. Um, and if, if I'm gonna err, I usually err in the direction of just fanning this, but I do really feel like that the Lord has has given me something to give to you today. And we're going to do that. And we're just going to keep moving in this vein. And um, let's go to Luke 23. Luke chapter 23. Hallelujah. Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23 and verse number 44.
And it was about the sixth hour. And there was a darkness over all of the earth until, someone say until, the ninth hour, and the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until, someone say until, until the ninth hour, until the ninth hour, until, until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Scripture records that the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. I don't know how revelatory the preaching will be today in the sense of, well, I've never seen that before. But I do feel like that God intends for the preaching to be prophetic here today. I want to preach something into the spirit, into the spirit of this church, into the spirit of every person. And I believe that the Lord has assured me that if I will obey Him today, that He will confirm this word with many signs following. I want to talk to this great gathering here today for just a few minutes on that thought until the ninth hour. Until the ninth hour. If you would, one more time, would you stretch your hands towards the heavens? Would you lift your voice one more time and ask God, to help us we need a word from you we need a word from the Lord come on ask the Lord for a word today Hallelujah. Now I want you to give the Lord a hand clap of anticipation. Come on. A hand clap of expectation. Come on. Is, does anybody expect the Lord? Come on. Is anybody, does anybody have an anticipation? Come on. It's in order. Go ahead. Come on, I feel an anticipation in the atmosphere. Come on, I feel an anticipation in the atmosphere. You can be seated. I want us to note the choice Of the wording here in our text, I will be moving in and out of a couple of different recordings of this particular incident, so just bear with me. The Bible says that there was darkness about the sixth hour. This translation, there was, comes from a Greek word which describes an event that slowly crept in on them before they knew what was happening. Suddenly, 
and unexpectedly, the clouds started rolling over the land, becoming darker and darker until finally an ominous dark gloom filled the entire sky and loomed over the landscape. Even, even the word that is translated dark here speaks something to the text because the word, the Greek word that is used here is not speaking of just any darkness, but it's speaking of of an utter darkness. I want to make this statement before we go any further. You have to understand something about darkness. It is pervasive. You cannot compartmentalize darkness. The darkness that I specifically want to address tonight is the darkness of your personal dilemma. The darkness, the circumstances, the situation that many of you have faced, some for years, some for months. The darkness of these dilemmas cannot be contained to just one area of your life. Eventually what will happen if it is undealt with is its darkness. And so it will eventually creep in, slowly creep in to every Heart, every aspect, every crook, corner, and cranny of your life. I'm talking about that situation. I'm not, I'm not here today to address the occasional thunderstorm that pops up and does its thing and moves on. I come to preach to you about that thing that has come and seemingly it has come to stay. It is that situation. It is that circumstance. It looms large. It is defiant in its darkness. It is, it is suffocating. In fact, I feel compelled in the spirit to preach to some people today that have given up any hope that that is ever going to change. The darkness of that dilemma in its, in its, defiant, in its defiant way has slipped into so many areas of your life. If you are not careful, that situation that circumstance, you know what it is, plug it in there. Whether it's with your family, whether it's spirits in this city, whether it's with your finances, it's that thing that is unceasing, unrelenting. I'm going to preach to you here today. It is, it is perpetual. It is, that, it is that unbroken thing in your life that you have just thrown your hands in the air and given up on that there is ever any expiration Though you have sought it with tears, many times you have run, come on now, you have run your hands around this situation. God, is there some kind of expiration date? Will this ever terminate? I'm preaching to some people that have lived with this for so long. You've given up any hope that it will ever be any different. Slowly, it has infiltrated into every area of your life your vision. It's become the spectacles, that situation in which you see the rest of the world through. You cannot, you cannot see anything any different just by seeing things through that situation. It's looming. It's very dark. There seems to be no end. It seems to be permanent, undying, unending, changeless, constant. I'm preaching to you right now. But God sent you a preacher here today to tell you that this thing does have an end. This situation does have an expiration date. Well, that's about 15 of you. That's fine. If it's only 15 of you, I'll preach to the 15 with the situation. Come on. You can't stay in the sixth hour. I've come to prophesy to this church. There's a ninth hour revival. There is a ninth hour revival lurking in the shadows. (laughs) 
Hallelujah. That situation that seemingly is changeless, it's unvarying, it's enduring, it's lasting, it's persistent. Come on. You're just looking for it to close out. You've given up any hope of any conclusion. Get your head up, baby, and square your shoulders because there's coming a ninth hour in which God is going to turn it all around in your favor. The way that this came to me came in a very dark time in my life. As you are, I had done many times. I had felt that situation, that circumstance, looking for some kind of crease, looking for some kind of opening. Will it ever conclude? Will it ever go away? Will this thing ever die? Will I bury this once and for all? Looking for an opening. Staring. Come on. Glaring down the dark tunnel. Looking for the slightest light at the end to give hope. I had just about given up that it was something that would never come to a conclusion. I remember where I was praying when the Lord brought this text to me. Listen to me now. And this is what the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me. He said, said if even my trial as sure as it had a beginning if even my trial had a beginning and it had an end who is the devil to try to convince you that this is never ending and will never come to a close Hallelujah. I'm preaching to the Lighthouse Church. I'm preaching to preachers on this platform. I'm preaching to faithful saints. Come on, I'm preaching. I'm preaching to a preacher's wife. You're fumbling through the darkness and the uncertainty of the eighth hour. But God wants you to know there's some closure coming. I hear a tearing. I hear a ripping. I hear a breaking forth. If you believe that, you ought to clap your hands and give God a shout of miraculous praise. Come on. Magnificent praise for a miraculous God. Hallelujah. I've come to proclaim to you that if Jesus, if his trial, if the darkness of his business had a beginning and it had an end, the darkness of this business that you're facing, I'm preaching to somebody right now. I don't care if it's 15 years old. I don't care if it's 15 months old. It's taking its toll on you. But I'm preaching a word to you. At the ninth hour, everything began to turn around. At the ninth hour, everything began to change well I don't feel that haven't felt that in fact there's not a synonym in my vocabulary that matches up to any of that In fact, I feel that I'm further from that than ever. Well, good news. Because usually when you feel that you're further away from it than ever, really in reality, you're closer to it than ever. Somebody didn't get that. Even Jesus, in this predicament, I believe, personifies, exemplifies, he is our example. Even Jesus in this situation, the overbearing, suffocating darkness from this situation, even, even, even Jesus, even Jesus said, God in the flesh said, he felt because he was God, but he was man, and he did have feelings. Even Jesus felt like this. I'm talking about moments before a veil was rent. 
I talk, are you hearing me now? I'm talking about a moment, just moments before everything began to change. Listen, listen to what Jesus cried from the cross. Father, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? Oh yeah, let me preach to somebody in this building. Come on, that's stumbling and you're fumbling through the fog of this uncertainty in your life. And you came to this house today and you feel forsaken. You feel forgotten. In fact, the devil has tried to use those feelings that are so real in your life to tell you, see there, because you feel that way, you are disqualified from anything ever changing. Come on, who are you? Where are you at today? Come on, you're here and you're faithful, but you feel forgotten. You prayed the prayers. You put the work in. You pushed the plate away, but it just seems like that nothing has come together for you. Let me tell you something. When you are feeling forsaken, when you are feeling forgotten, you're closer to a veil being rent than you ever imagined. You, you, hallelujah. Listen to me, Lighthouse Church. Whatever these spirits are, whatever it is that has been oppressing your family, whatever it is that's come against your marriage and it's left you, it's like in the spirit. I see a man with his hands laid open like, God, where are you at? Do you know where I'm at? Have you forgotten me? You feel forsaken, but I've come to preach to you. You're going to feel like that until the ninth hour and at the ninth hour, at the ninth hour. The feelings, the feelings of forsakenness, the feelings of God, God's forgotten. They're the real feelings. They're the real feelings, Brother Daniel. They're real feelings. But you need to identify where these feelings are. God. These are the feelings of the eighth hour. You know how many revivals I've seen die in the eighth hour? You know how many churches I've seen on the verge of exploding in Dublin and it just fall off the cliff in the eighth hour? Come on, there's that liminal time of uncertainty. I'm preaching to some of you right now. You don't have the answers. Come on, you're just, you're just trying to feel your way through this. There is no certainty. The ground underneath you, when there is ground, is shifting ground. You don't know what tomorrow holds. Come on, God, do you know where I'm at? Did you not see what I did? Did you not hear what I preached? Did you not see? Did you not see the sacrifice? Did you not? see the time did you not see the faithfulness those are feelings of the eighth hour but I've seen so many ninth hour tearings turnarounds <laughs> I guess we'll find out if I'm a false prophet or not I, I, I have battled this because I am nobody but I felt like I felt like that God sent me here because this church is at an intersection in time and I believe that 2017 is going to tell the story better come on I believe it's going to reveal what I'm telling you right now I believe that there's some things Hallelujah. I don't want to embarrass him because Brother Lance is one of those guys that's 
just comes off as having it all together. But he told me right before I came up here, he said, I have confidence in you. I asked God, I said, you got this beautiful building and you got all these people here and wonderful worship and two or three altar calls before the preacher ever could get here. But Brother Lance, it's like I've seen something laid on your shoulders. I don't know what that's a type of, but it's like a heavy pressure that just presses on your mind and presses on your shoulders. And I'm like, God, there's no way. There's too many things in order, but it is what it is. But I've come to tell you, God's fixing to remove that pressure. God's about to remove that weight. Lighthouse Church. Hear what I'm telling you? I need men to rally behind me. Come on, God's about to break some things financially in this local assembly. And you're like, I'm like, God, why in the world would you be talking to me about the weight of finances and just trying to make this? You're robbing Peter to pay Paul and you're just trying to keep everything covered. I'm telling you, there's fixing to be a financial break in this church where it's not just enough, but God's going to give you more than enough. Not. Buddy Carol, this has an end. It's not going to be like this the rest of your life. Look, though, those feelings are indicative. The feelings of forsakenness and forgottenness are indicative that you're living in the dark hours of the eighth hour. It's indicative there's a ninth hour breakthrough around the corner. But listen, there's so many, there's so many ninth hour ripping of the veils that never happen because somehow we don't survive the uncertainty. Brother Daniel, the eighth hour. Brother Richardson. I'm, I'm so humbled you're here today. I don't, I don't even need this microphone. To have an elder here like this, my prayer is he'll just help us push this through. I'm so glad you and your wife are here. But at 36 years old, I don't know much, but I figured this out. My business is not to try to figure out and manage how all this stuff's going to happen. My business is learning to manage me. Until all this stuff happens. You know why Joseph could manage an empire? You know why? Because Joseph knew how to manage Joseph. It wasn't Joseph's first famine. And so I think the key, or I believe very strongly, the key to a ninth hour veil ripping and renting. I believe that it hinges on how well we manage those real normal feelings. If Jesus had those feelings, it's normal for me to have those feelings. That doesn't make me of less of a preacher. That doesn't make you a less of a saint. Dear God, I'm going to pull over and park here for a minute. That doesn't make you a less of a person just because you're going through a season in your life and you wonder where in the world is God. That doesn't mean you're not cut out for this. That doesn't mean you quit. 
I'm preaching to some of you. The devil's showing you your feelings about this whole situation and trying to talk you out of your investment. God, have mercy. Help me to get somebody by the nap of the neck and get your attention today. Don't give up on your investment. Dear God, there's a ninth hour coming. These So it's the management of those real normal feelings of the eighth hour that determines whether or not we have that ninth hour revival. And Jesus gives us an example of this. Father, into your spirit, into your hands, I commend my spirit. I've learned in the uncertainty of the eighth hour when you feel like it's never going to end, that you're never going to turn the corner, that the prayer's never going to be answered, you're never going to have that revival. I've learned that my responsibility is to make sure that regardless of how real the feelings are, regardless of what they said, regardless of what they did to you, I'm preaching to some people today that have some le legitimate hurts some le legitimate baggage that a lot of people would have never survived. It's a miracle you're still even here today. It's a miracle you still even have confidence in a preacher, somebody in the pulpit. Are you hearing me right now? The key to managing the darkness, the uncertainty, the fog. Come on. That never ending, unrelenting darkness that just hangs over your life. It's no matter how many days you have to do it in the eighth hour. You got to keep taking what they said and putting it into the hands of God. You got to keep taking the injustice. You got to keep taking the unforgiveness you got to keep taking the bitterness you can my life changed a couple of years ago in the sight and sound theater in Branson and we're putting on the production of Joseph I don't know I was with other preachers. I guess God just had it for me because no one else seemed to catch it. I was sobbing. I've sobbed many times since replaying it. It's all coming to a head. Joseph's closer to his ninth hour than he's ever been. He's endured all of the mess. He's sitting there on the throne and he looks up. And he sees these boys and they look familiar to him. I don't know who the director was, but it was ingenious. Absolutely ingenious. Because it showed the humanity of a hero of ours, a scriptural hero of ours. In the production, Joseph becomes overwhelmed. Yes, with love, but also at the same time, he was overwhelmed with anger. Reliving and remembering everything they had put him through. And he rolls off of the throne and the stage blacks out. Oh God, whoever did this, ingenious. The next thing you know, the light comes on stage right and Joseph's in his bed chambers and he's wrestling. He's wrestling. And his wife walks up over to him and says, Joseph, remember in the dreams, your sheep, Aaron Curtis, your sheep was upright. Oh, I, I may have embarrassed the ones around me. I didn't care. I went, oh! Because dreams and ninth hour veils ripping hinge and are contingent on me keeping myself upright. 
Maintaining my integrity. Maintaining my innocency. Not in an argumentative way of who is right and who is wrong. I'm talking about innocency, purity of spirit. You church, you hear what I'm telling you? I don't mean it any other way, but humbly, this church is on the verge of one of the greatest revivals that this part of the country has ever seen. Please keep your spirit right. Please stay undefiled by the world and undefiled by disappointment and undefiled by vitriol and undefiled. a miracle on the way please don't get bitter there's an answer on the way please don't please don't get bitter please don't get hard please don't harbor unforgiveness please don't become indifferent please don't become jaded Worry about how dark it is? No! I worry that, I worry about, no, regardless of how dark it is, that I don't let the darkness get in my soul. The earth can be filled with darkness, but it doesn't matter if I manage to keep it out of my heart. Here, a ripping. You haven't had your greatest revelations. You haven't seen your greatest revivals. At the ninth hour, the ninth hour is the ending of one thing. But don't let the number nine fool you. It not only signifies the closing of one thing, but the number nine signifies the beginning of something else. Lighthouse Church, Brother Marx has come to preach to you that God's not only bringing an end to this junk, but God's bringing a beginning of something else, a beginning of the miraculous, a beginning of healings, a be- What if I told you I felt in the spirit that God would say to you that he's going to make the ninth hour miracle in your life so great that it causes you to forget any of the painful memories of the sixth, the seventh, and the eighth hour. Oh, this light affliction. <laughs> light affliction this light affliction in fact the wording there and we got the walking strong concordance here but just a little little nugget that little light affliction there give you a word picture it's the buoyancy up underneath something that helps it fly come on a man had a revelation it's affliction he wasn't meaning it was little affliction as far as in quantity he was speaking of the quality of his affliction it's much affliction but quality wise it's affliction that's going to make me fly it's affliction that's going to buoy me it's affliction what is the darkness what is the darkness of the 6th and the 7th and the 8th hour to 120 to 3,000 to the Lord adding daily if this church is not ready 
You need to be getting it ready for daily revival. I'm talking about daily baptisms. I'm not sure. Hey, I don't know if it's here. I don't know where it's at. I'm still looking for it. He's probably heard me say this because I've been saying it for probably six months now. I still believe, and, it, and I believe this very well could be the year, that I'm going I'm to be a part of revivals that start to, to steamroll. I don't mean this presumptuously. It's somewhere. I'm not saying it's here. I'm just saying somewhere. I have been preaching this for six months or a year that I believe there are revivals, and I believe 2017 would be a good year for it, where it starts to steamroll, and we have church 28, 21, 28, 30, 30 nights in a row. Oh, yeah. Five or six rights. Keep dealing with the minutia of your eight, eighth hour then. I'm talking about a ninth hour with a veil rinse and every dish. And you say, well, we got this going on and this going on and this going on and this going on. But, 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 but the, the glory cloud is so thick. It's not do we have church, but how do we not have church? trumps everything it it trumps organization it trumps and I'm about organization it trumps schedules and schedules are necessary but you don't schedule a real revival you can't do it because you know what happens at the ninth hour at the ninth hour God sends angelic beings To the hungry Cornelius. At the ninth hour. I believe the elder, I believe the elder Richardson probably could testify of what I'm telling you. He's seen these ninth hour revivals where God releases angels. Come on. And one goes to Cornelius' house and the other one goes to the rooftop of Simon Peter. And it's not just personal evangelism anymore. And it's not just door, door knocking campaigns or putting door hangers. Come on. And all those things are important. But it's when evangelism turns supernatural. It's when evangelism turns apostolic and angels are released into the harvest field and God starts connecting us. As a whole, the apostolic movement has worked and labored extremely hard with very little yield. Are you hearing me right now? And we blamed it on a lot of things. But the Lord said that the harvest was great. Do you have a problem with me believing that there is a shift in the spirit and we're going to keep working hard, but God's going to, in the night tower, God is going to give us a whole lot more yield for the labor that we're investing I'm talking about in, 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 the next, in the next couple of weeks. It's going to happen with you and through you. Let's go eat here. I don't want to go eat here. What, what made you want to go eat there? We had not been there a long time. Let's just go here. And you walk in. And there's an angel. That was an angel. It was the same angel that God sent to Cornelius. It was the same angel that went to the rooftop of Simon Peter's house. It's the angels that create spiritual nexuses. And people are put together. They're here. Pseudo suicidal single mothers are here in this city. But God in the night hour will send angels. So I'm not against knocking a thousand doors. But in the night hour, if God can send an angel and say, no, come right over here. And you walk in, and as soon as you walk in, it's the greeter, and you go, oh. Or you sit down. Or you sit down, and a lady starts waiting on you, and you notice she's looking at you kind of strangely. And then before the meal's over, she leans over, and your wife's here and says, excuse me, um, are you guys apostolic? We have lived in the frustra frustrating fog of feeling like failures, praying all, all the while. How many times had Peter and John passed the man at the gate beautiful?
all the while praying, but feeling like failures. And at the ninth hour, at the ninth hour, that guy they laid at the gate daily. All the times that they had passed him, that day he got up. The ninth hour, miracles begin to happen in frustrated places where we only dreamed of them happening. Things just start. Pew, 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 pew. Maybe you have objection. Maybe there's objection here today to walking up the doors and no longer having to beat them down, pry them open, or solve some great puzzle as far as how to open them. Maybe you're opposed. Maybe you're an objection to walking in a ninth hour anointing when you walk up to the door and it just whew. it's not much that's come easy. But I'm telling you there's some things. I'm not telling you that all the enemies are going to go away. I'm not telling you that. Your challenges are going to change. The devils you've been fighting are going to change. You occasionally this and that deal with human spirits and rebellion. But you're, you're not, you're not, this is, this is not something now where you're dealing with human spirits and you're trying to gather people. And uh, No, no, no. There's a shifting happening in this church. There's a shifting. We're not fighting. We're not fighting. I'm talking about overall, the big picture. We're not fighting human wills and human ideologies and paradigms. No, this church is really fixing the faith. Just remember, just remember, oh yeah, there's great adversaries, but it's that great door. It's that great and effectual door which I believe God is opening up to this church. Here, I'm telling you. You don't know me. I believe God is forming a relationship. So maybe it's too early to get this personal, but I have to be obedient right now. With my face on the floor early this morning, I began to pray. And sometimes we pray and we're not even paying attention to what we're praying. And I stopped long enough to listen to what I was praying. And I heard myself praying this. God. Would you give the Apostolic Church, the Lighthouse in Jackson, Tennessee, would you give them, stand up, Brother Lance, would you give them the spirit of Jonathan's armor bearer? So what are you talking about, Brother Marks? Jonathan told his armor bearer, this is what I think we can do. For 11 years, God sent a man and a lady here. And for 11 years, this man carefully, prayerfully has been preaching to this church, preparing you for what he believes and envisions that God can do. But I think now it's time in turn for Jonathan's armor bearer to look back and say, all that is in thine heart, do it. I am with thee. Listen, listen, because here's the deal. The Spirit said to your pastor before I walked up here, one word, aggressive. 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 I believe we're fixing to get more aggressive than we've ever been about apostolic revival in this church and in this city. Listen, listen, listen. Listen. This great church, you wonderful people that have done just your... Unbelievably, you have followed this man, the wonderful things that have happened in this church. No complaints. This man's never complained. We don't have those kind of conversations. I'm not here being down on this church. God's just looking right now 
right now, at this moment, at this intersection, at this ninth hour moment, where all kinds of things are fixing to shift and change, the whole landscape's about to be different. God is looking for this church to have the spirit of Jonathan's armor bearer that says, Brother and Sister Lance, if it's in your heart, are there any men that feel a witness to what I'm saying right now? Would you get on your feet? Are there any men? I'm looking for men first. Men. Here's, here's one right here. It's got my back. All that's in your heart. Every bit of it. We want it. Men, help me. We don't care how big it is. We don't care how impossible it may seem. We don't care how outlandish at times the enemy wants you to think, oh yeah, that's a vision for somebody out on the West Coast or in New York City. We don't care. Right in the middle of the bell buckle of the Bible bell, if God said to you, we could do it, I'm looking for you. If God said we could do it, let's go. I don't care if it's a rock and a hard place. Come on, we're with you. We don't care how big. We don't care how extreme. We don't care how extravagant. Come on, man. I need some men to rally around me right now. If it's in your heart, let's go. Let's do it. Let's double. Let's build that next building. Let's come on, man. Where are you at? Let's let's break a thousand. Come on. We I don't care what they say can't be done. If it's in your heart. If it's in your heart. This is just my personal opinion. This church has been blessed to have these people as your leaders for the last 11 years. Listen, and they've done a fantastic job, okay? Listen, but I'm going to tell you what I know. And at times you see glimpses of it. You haven't even yet tasted, his wife knows, you haven't even yet tasted and really reaped from the part of that man that hands down made him the most successful evangelist in his time. And it was that tenacity. I'm not saying he hasn't passed you with that, but there's a part of him, just a fearless, Every time he'd hit the pulpit, I see his mother-in-law nodding her head. Every time he'd hit the pulpit, it, it reminded me of a lion. Not, not in a destructive way, unless it was devils. We wended our way through this, all this business. And now there's a solid foundation. <laughs> and there's a core here. And God's saying, okay, now, now, buddy, now. Hey, there's some things in that man right there. You just trust what I'm telling you. Because I, I know the hands. I know the men that play parts. I know, I know the fingerprints. I know. You think the last 11 years have been a ride, baby. You, you haven't seen anything yet. The ninth hour, that ripping, whatever's going on right now. Believe the morning of this new day is going to bring light to this stuff. All of it. Men, is that what you want? We want it all. All of it. You go home and you read it. That's what he said. All that's in your heart. You do it. And I'm with you. with you. Let's take this city. Let's take this city. Let's start those satellites. The things in your heart for young ministers. The thing. Oh, God. Here we go.
Here we. This church is, let me tell you something. Am I okay? This church needs to understand. You're healthy enough now. It's time for some of that stuff that supported us. God, I'm okay. I don't believe that God has put all these giftings in this church for us to just benefit us. And some of this stuff that kept you alive and you needed it to keep you alive. Now you're breathing on your own. I believe, again, all that's in your heart. I believe there's going to be things born out of here. Come on. That's going to have an impact on the apostolic movement. Come on. Hear what? All that. Come on, Lighthouse. This is not just about us. At the night tower, we're going to start making a world impact. Like, do you believe that? Do you believe that? Do you believe that? An impact on other preachers. An impact on preachers' kids. An impact on other churches. Are we being presumptuous? No. It's the miracle of the ninth hour. I close with this I ran across this I daily do a a word study and not long ago and this is what I leave you with I ran across this in Paul's writings to the church of Philippi he says in chapter number one according to to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed but that with all boldness the word that I'd like to draw to your attention it's a Greek word that was translated into an English phrase earnest expectation was a word <laughs> brother Lance it, it looks as if though Paul just morphed a word for himself it was never used before and it was never used after it's translated earnest expectation I'll humor you the word is opa Cairo Dokia. You ready for the translation? Here's what it means. Opa or Appa is a prefix that means to turn away with concentration, ignoring other interests. Cairo is the head, and Dokia is to stretch forward. <laughs> Earnest expectation, Paul said. With my head, I have turned away from everything else. With all boldness, I have taken my eyes, Brother Daniel. I have taken my head. I've turned it away with con concentration, ignoring other distractions. And with my head, I am stretching forward. God, you're missing it. Eager expectation. I'm telling the Lighthouse Church, come on, this, this is my assignment. It is your mandate from this day forward. It's time to turn your head from all distractions of the eighth hour. It's time to stretch. You ready? It's time to stretch your face into the future. What does God have? What is God going to do? What?
you're breathing, the Holy Ghost is about to hit this place. I want you to stand. You think it was in here earlier. If you're breathing, unless you're physically incapacitated, you can stay where you're at physically if you're not able. Elders, if you would like, I would like you to come forward. And if you can't stand, just sit on the front rows. But if you're physically able, where you're, wherever you're at in the picture of this church, peripheral, perimeters, the fence, the core, wh wherever you're at and all that. If you're breathing, if you're breathing, I believe the Lord's fixing to do miracles. If you're here and you don't have the Holy Ghost, I believe God, I believe God, if you want the Holy Ghost in the next few moments, when this thing sweeps through here, I believe God can fill you with the Holy Ghost. Baptism of the Holy Ghost. If you're breathing, I want you to get it from your pew right now, and I want you to make your way to the front. And I want you to stand. Men, I'm asking you to press in close. If you're breathing, would you move from where you're at? Young people, men, women, visitors. They're coming. That's it. Come on. That's it. Come on. That's it. Come on. Nobody's, nobody's going to make you do anything you don't want to do. Just, I'm asking you, in, in reverence and honor to the moving of the Holy Ghost to the word of God I'm asking you to respond right now that's it they're coming if you're here if you're a visitor here and you need a miracle in your body you need you need a miracle in your marriage I'm asking you you ought, you ought to come right now don't stay where you're at don't stay where you're at don't stay where you're at hallelujah we're going to do something once you get down here get ready come on now listen do, do you believe that Jericho walls still fall? I believe it was Brother Stone King and what a, what a revelation. We've done it for years, but he just put words to it. Satan is the prince, the power of the air. I don't know if you've heard him talk about that, but when you shout, you're, you're shredding. You're shredding, shredding the air. You're shredding Satan. There's something that happens when the people of God lift their voice. Do you want this revival? No, no, no. I'm talking about with, with perpetuity, with continuity, something that just, I'm talking about this everyday business. I'm talking about the operation of, a, of an apostolic church. I'm talking about, I'm talking about Saturday nights. Where it's nothing necessarily that's called or organized, but Saturday nights where this place becomes a place where folks gather and there's such an expectation for the Sunday service that there's, there's breakouts and prayer meetings that happen right here in this auditorium on Saturday, Saturday nights before Sunday ever, huh? I'm talking about that kind of revival. Do you want to see God, do you want to see God move in your families? I'm talking about epic, unprecedented. Come on, is that the kind of revival you're looking for? How, how bad do you want that? Do, do you, how bad do you want that? Here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to count to three. When I get to three, if you want that revival just a little bit, I'm telling you, it's, it's fixing to blow in here right now. The Holy Ghost. You walked in here with pain. When this happens in a few minutes, the pain's going to leave. You hear what I'm telling you right now? The pain's going to leave. You came in here bound. You came in here with things just, just that have tackled your mind and twisted them. I'm telling you, when this shout goes forth, it's going to, the pain in your back's going to leave. You're going to begin to speak with tongues, with an authority. You hear what I'm telling you? Here's what we're going to do. When I get to three, if you want this revival, just some, you, you, you identify it by the volume of your voice. If you want it just a little bit, you just, just let out a little bitty cry. I'm telling you. Some of you fixing to feel something you never felt before in your life. The Holy Ghost, the God of heaven, is going to confirm his word with signs and wonders. Are you ready? But if you wanted a whole lot, I mean from your toes. There's a man, I'm not looking, I've, I've seen it, I know where it's at. I'm just trying to build faith. There's a man and lady here. It's on the rocks, it's touch and go. I'm telling you, 
your help's coming in the midst of this shout the Holy Ghost is going to move up in that situation he's going to strengthen he's going to strengthen that relationship he's going to give you the capacity to forgive are you ready you want it bad you're going to have to I'm talking about from your toes we're going to shake hey they're going to do it here in a little bit 80,000 in a football stadium no 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 we're going to shake this place are you ready one get ready here we go Come on, get your hands up. Your head up. One, two, three, go. Go.